which Cohen is the real Cohen. This 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 happens when I go on dates too. They'll be like, <laughs> are you like psychoanalyzing me? Are you kidding me? I am I not kidding with you. Wow. And it shows that because I want to see my client, mm -hmm. my patient, as a human, not someone who is sick. You feel safe to express something without the fear of them judging you. And one day they don't have me anymore. How could they have the tools to help themselves? You're not there for them anymore. You're there for yourself. Oh. You're doing it so you feel good that you have helped someone. All these problems is about the struggle of existing in the world. If you can't save yourself, you can save no one. Okay. Self-care is not selfish. So for now, Chut Pak Jai keeps me from not being burnt out. We can all be queer. We can in, all be... In that definition, is good for you. Correct. My mom doesn't understand shit. <laughs> she doesn't know uh, anything but... I, my sex drive is high. Okay. But I have no desire to practice it with someone. Ah. Ah. This is like a Oh, man. Damn. This is Comedy Featuring. My name is Big and welcome to the show. So, wellness has been such a buzzword for the past couple of years. And uh, it's not just about the physical diseases that we are battling, but we all went through the mental hardship together during lockdown, during COVID. So it has never been so crucial. And today we're talking to someone uh, with the expertise and uh, their study about this, and they're working as an existential psychotherapist. Such an impressive title. And I think we all are curious right now that what that is. So let's go talk to them. Kuen Patara Danai. So adi ka. Very happy to be here. I'm so thankful that you're here. So honored. Well, so Kuen Patara Danai. Yes. Before, like, Let's let's take us back like years ago. How many years? <laughs> That's a good question. So, it's so let's long. not go so um, that many years. But you used to be someone in a very uh, entertaining business. Yes. Yeah. But now that part of your life is kind of over, and you have moved on yeah. to the next phase yeah. of your life. Or well, let's say. When we say it's over, right? Mm. We're assuming that it means it's gone. Mm. I don't feel it. I don't see him anymore. Mm. I think, you know, chaotic. Uh -huh. People always, still call you that. Yeah, yeah, it's always a part of me. Mm. Mm. But again, through this journey, I have also accepted different parts of me and grow into things I yeah. enjoy. And it's right. also meaningful to me too. Yeah, it looks like you have a lot of fun being who you are oh, and working. On what you do right now, too. 100%. Uh, that's a great thing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, today, thank you for coming and talk to us about this because it's not very easy to find someone to talk to when it comes to, like, um, psychotherapy thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what you are right now. You are a psychotherapist. Yes, a psychotherapist. Okay. And, and not the um, usual kind, the existential <laughs> psychotherapist. Very impressive um, title. Can, I get, can, would you like to <laughs> like uh, elaborate on what that means? Like okay. existential part, especially. I guess when you go into psychotherapy, right? It's like Hogwarts, I would say. Because uh -huh. in Hogwarts, you have like Slytherin and uh -huh. Gryffindor, Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw, right? Yeah. And as soon as you go into the psychotherapy world, you have to like freaking pick a school of thought too. Oh, really? Whether you want to be like... A, a humanistic school, psychoanalytic school, uh, or I behavioral see. school. Uh -huh. So I was like, how do I, how do I want to work with my patients? How do I want to work with my clients? Mm. So I went with the existential school because existential, mm. uh, if we break it down easily, it comes from like excess to excess as yeah. a human. And it shows that because I want to see my client, mm. my patient, mm -hmm. As a human, not someone who is sick. Ah, okay. This is the thing now. Like, if we see someone who is sick, we treat them like a sick person, a sick right? Person, yeah. But to me, they're not sick. 
They're going mm. through something quite difficult. They're going through changes. They're going through struggles. They're going through obstacle, mm. and that's why I picked the existential school because the school of thought itself is to see how we are as a human. Mm. What is it as an experience as a person in this finite time being on Earth? I see. And I chose that school. So okay. If it's the Hogwarts school, I am in existential school. Okay, so but, really but like that's it. your like your point of view, your goal, yeah. and the way you see people. Yeah. But um, how do you know if you're qualified or were born to do this? Because I guess there's no sorting hat for that. You really have to like. Um, how, how do you know that this is what I'm qualified to do? I think. A lot of question when people ask like, "How do you know you you want to be a therapist?" Mm. I would say this as a psychotherapist already is that the books, the scholar, the information you know, it's just something that you fall on when you get quite lost. Mm. So you have a structure, a framework to work with. Mm. I think 60% to like 80% is who you are as a person, and how can you bring that. Into the room. I see. And again, let's go back into the case of like why the existential school, right? I think a lot of the time when we see the psychoanalytic school, mm. psychoanalytic is they work with the unconsciousness. Just by some note, a lot CBT school works with behavioral. So if they're bad, how do we make them not bad? But then the human humanistic school, right? It it let you understand and incorporate the. The culture, the humanness, uh, the pain, the trauma, and often, please do not forget when we study these phenomenological like approaches, right? Mm -hmm. We're taking a very westernized lens. Uh. So, for example, if I am looking through the books, my textbook. And they say what depression is, right? Please do not forget we are trying to understand depression through a very westernized lens. So, someone who is westernized, it's written by a white middle class person. Sometimes depression for them is different for someone who is depressed in Thailand. Mm. So again, using that lens is already already difficult. Mm. But if we look at it through the humanistic lens, right? I can incorporate my own culture, my own pain, my own understanding of being human, mm -hmm. and bring the client into the room. Uh -huh. And I guess why I, I click I click with that modality. Yeah, it sounds like it's more like relatable as a person to a person. I would think so because okay. I think because uh, I. My client base is very wide. I've worked with European people, British mm. people, mm. Asian people, Southeast Asian people, mm. and already for them, mm. when when they come into the room and they're like, "I'm depressed," the first question I would ask is that, "What does depression means for you? Uh. Please explain to me how you understand depression." Rather than being like, "Oh, you're depressed. It means mm. you can't sleep. You can't eat. Mm. Let's treat you by how the book says." Mm. It, it, it doesn't work like that for me. I see. Okay, so you're doing your PhD at the moment. Yes, I and am. And you're also taking on clients as a part of your education, right? I should finish my doctorate this year. I see. It's been a hell of a journey. How how long has it been? How many years? <sighs> Tra traumatic. Uh, <laughs> including this year, it should this this should be my fourth year, mm. and I should be finishing this year or next year. So around okay. five years. Okay. So is this like normal, the usual amount of time that a PhD student would take to finish <laughs> their degree? They lied to us. <laughs> what? They lied to us. Uh -huh. uh, when I saw the program, right? Mm. They were like, do this program with us. Uh, uh. You'll get your doctorate degree. You'll get your clinical practice. Uh. And you can do it in four years. Ah, they promised four years. Yeah. Okay. And every year... I finish a module, mm. and they say, "Give us feedback." My feedback would be like, "You fuckers, you lied to us. <laughs> no one could finish this in four years. We have to go to school. Mm. We have to teach students. Mm. We have to do our clinical practice. Oh. Write our dissertation. Uh -huh. Do case studies. Mm. Go into clinical supervision. It's impossible to do in four years. Okay, but and this is a full time for you. This you is a full time. Don't degree. do anything else. Yeah. Oh, they, they don't know I'm in Thailand, running around in dresses and doing <laughs> content. They don't know that. I okay. Keep that very separate. Okay. They can find out, <laughs> but I won't tell them that. Okay. I'm like, I just stay at home. Yeah. And it's so, it's it's so much fun. But mm -hmm. I will say this to 
everyone who's considering on mm. doing a doctorate or doing a PhD, like, mm. don't do it to please your parents. Don't do it because you want status from it. Like, do it because you really love mm. the topic. And the things you are trying to investigate for it, because it's like a marathon. Mm. If you don't have enough support, it's very difficult for you to push through. That's why you see so many PhD or doctorate candidates quit like one year before they graduate. Oh, they do that because they get they get very stressed, they get depressed, okay. and when they ask for support, right? Not a lot of people understand the struggle too, mm. and all they hear is like, "อีกปีเดียวก็จบแล้วคือไปก่อนเดี๋ยวก็ทำได้แล้ว but ทำได้ทำไปแล้ว so they quit and often when they quit they say it's the best decision they've made too and I'm like good for you good okay for you. Uh-huh. but but it depends on whether or not they might need that for their career yeah. because it could be an asset it could yes. be like credentials for status. you status like in, in your case yeah. you you do need oh, a I, PhD I, I, I need I need this doctorate because uh, right now currently I'm a psychotherapist I'm a practicing psychotherapist in the UK And my license allowed me to work in Europe too. I see. But I'm aiming for the psychologist to be to become a psychologist. Oh. And in the UK, the minimum requirement to become a psychologist is to have a PhD or a doctorate. To become a doctor, mm. you need to become a psychologist. Okay. Yes. Would that mean you have to study some more in order to become a psychologist, or you can just? I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> okay. You don't need to. If I finish this doctorate, okay, automatically I become a psychologist. I see. Yes. Okay. So can you tell us the difference between just being a therapist and yes. being a, a psychologist and also a psychiatrist? Okay. What are the differences? Okay. So disclaimer first: this do not apply here in Thailand. Oh. Because you have a different body here. You have a different system here. Okay. What I'm saying is based in the UK. Mm. So a counselor. And a psychotherapist is trained differently, so maybe they go through a different training, different uh, placement. So, uh, how do you say? Oh, and I see. the modules you like put through practical is training. Yes, it's um, different. Okay. So, counselor, psychotherapist, and if you want to be a psychologist, you need at least a PhD or a doctorate. And when you become a psychologist, you don't even have you don't only have to do talking therapy or talking cure. Mm. You can do research, you can do academic work, and you can do other things too. I see. So this is the tier between psycho uh, counselor, psychotherapist, and a psychologist. So we do the talking therapy. Mm. We talk, we assess, we we try to heal through talking. Mm. No medicine. I see. Okay, you cannot prescribe no drugs to people. Yeah. Okay. Psychiatrists, on the other hand, they are medically trained, mm. so they do less of the talking, they do more of the prescribing, and I think that's the key difference here. I see. Yeah. Okay, and I think uh, you choose this because you're very good at talking to people. <laughs> because we I have so. talked a little bit beforehand, we have never met before. No, we've and never met. Five minutes into the conversation with you, I already feel like I know you a lot, and I feel close to you. And I, th- I think it was a fun conversation that we had before. Oh yeah. So that's why I was excited for this um, episode as well. You're very good at talking to people. I, I Have you always been good <laughs> at talking to people like this? I feel like saying I'm good at talking is giving too much credit. I think I was curious about you. Uh-huh. And when I'm curious about someone, I can find space to play around with that. Mm. I want to know why they are like this. I want to know what they went through. I wonder why this career. Mm. So when I find someone interesting, it's very easy for me to be indulged in the conversation. Uh. So just now, I, I you sat there, and you look really relaxed in your shorts and your cap, <laughs> and you were like, "Oh, nice to have you, Quan." And I'm like. Damn! <laughs> Tell me more about you. Oh, okay. And I guess I was curious about you because mm. I don't think I want to talk to everyone. I see. Because okay. if 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 the if the assumption is that I'm good at talking and I can talk to anyone, then uh. it means I find everyone interesting. Uh. That's not the point. Uh, I find not some people the curious. Case. Not always the case. I see. Yeah, but okay. I'm always curious about my clients and patients. Yeah, though. I yes. was gonna say that would help you a lot yeah. into doing your work yeah. well yeah. because you're like authentically curious about yes. people. Yes. Mm. Yes. Okay. So, um, when this, this this happens when I go on 
dates too, and I go on romantic Ooh, dates. Okay. They'll be like, "Are you like psychoanalyzing me?" Because I'm like, "Oh, tell me more about you. Uh. What about school?" And they'll be like, <laughs> "Knowing what you do for a living, yeah. they then, might assume." They might assume, yeah. and then they go like, "Are you psychoanalyzing me?" <laughs> and I'm like, "No, you didn't pay me." <laughs> I don't even know if you're paying for this dinner or not. So if you're not paying me, I'm not doing my job. Ah, uh-huh. yeah. Okay. To yeah. all the men and boys out there. <laughs> But do you like that when people do that to you? Like, I, because I assume that people would not um, like it too much for when they feel like they are being analyzed by someone who you know you may not know that well, right? You'd be surprised by <laughs> how many people would be like. Analyze me, analyze me, uh, okay, okay. and I will be like one to ten. How much would you want me to analyze you? Mm, really analyze you, right? Yeah, and if they say ten, they end up quite sad and crying a lot because it's a lot about bringing like things up. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a mm. lot about bringing them up. Mm-hmm. But I do not psychoanalyze anyone without consent. Uh, I do not conceptualize anyone without consent because mm. again, that's work. Yeah. I don't want to bring work out of the office. I see. Like that's. A different thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, can you um, tell us about your session in general? Not like no details, but I just wanna know like what's going on mm. when a mm. person walk into your mm. your room okay. and then you start your session. Okay. What do you do? First of all, to all the viewers out there who is interested in becoming a professional mental health worker, don't forget as soon as you become. A psychologist, a psychotherapist, a psychiatrist. You don't just become a psychotherapist for your patient. You become a psychotherapist to everyone. Mm. So your family, your mm. friends, people who are close to you. Mm. No one comes to a psychotherapist happy. So accept that first. If you want to work in this field, you will have to take a lot on because people will be like, "I, I need to talk. Mm. I'm having this problem. Can we talk?" Mm. And it's about you, if how much you can d- draw boundaries towards that. And I guess as an existential psychotherapist, right? How I work is that I don't, I don't lead on. I will just sit there until they bring something up. Like okay. I think how I would start a session to the clients with me. I would be like, so what would you like to talk about today? Mm. And if they didn't talk about something, they were very persistent to talk about last session. Mm. I won't bring it up because okay. it's about how they can hold their own autonomy in this room. Uh, yeah, okay. and then I work. I work with that. Yeah. I work with that. Yeah. Just encourage people to talk, to talk, and to bring it back into the room. Mm. For, for for example, if for example if someone said to me in the session, saying like, I feel very unseen, and I I have no place to speak about how I feel, and I feel like. People don't really respect me. Mm. My to go to would be like, hmm, you're saying that you don't really have a voice, but I experience you here right now mm-hmm. to be very able to express about your frustration, about mm. you don't feel heard. Mm. I wonder what's happening here, because uh, okay. whatever they do here, they're doing outside too. So my work in the room is to listen to them and to bring out the themes about. How they are inside the room and outside the room. Mm. Yeah. And what would be the usual expectations that a client might might have for you? Mm-hmm. Like, okay, please tell me what's wrong with me, or how do I fix it? This is what I <laughs> assume because it it should be like something that people would expect from a session, right? I'm so good at telling them that I won't fix them. Oh, okay. I'm so good at. Not giving them answers, cause mm. don't forget if I fix them for them and I gave them answers, right? And one day they don't have me anymore. Mm. How could they have the tools to help themselves? Therefore, the therapist's job is not to fix or to give tools, but a therapist's job is to guide that person who shares the same space mm. to know how they would deal with that without us being here. Mm. And if I tell them. They would never understand how they could do it themselves. Mm. My job is to sit there patiently and explore more and more and more. Mm. So they, when they leave the room mm. and I'm not there, they are able to deal with the problem themselves. I see. Yeah. So what what kind of struggles do you see the most? Like most commonly Ooh. seen or found? I work with. I think people think I work with gender a lot, right? Mm. 
But at the end of the day, it's like it's such a wide spectrum. Uh, I work with people who have depression, bipolar, autism. I work with porn addict, drugs addict. I work with people who's going through transitioning their gender, like a very wide spectrum. But at the end of the day, to me, mm-hmm. all these problem is about the struggle of existing in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, do you think? Uh, dealing with people in a different and wide variety of struggles or problems is fun for you, or you would like to be specialized in something mm-hmm. specifically. I, I am ex- I am specialized in working with gender, I so see. so the experiencing of coming out, mm. or what does being queer means? Mm. What does it mean to not belong? That's mm. my speciality. Mm. You know, working with a wide range of clients mm. help me understand myself more, ah. and understanding my clients more too. So mm. I keep it very open. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it benefits you too as oh, of a course. person. Of course, yeah. I would say it does feed into my narcissistic needs too. <laughs> But one thing I would say yeah. when I talk about therapy work and about myself is that I don't paint myself to look good. If I say it feeds my ego, I would mm. say it feeds my ego. Mm. Even for me to go teach classes or do psychotherapy, that's a part of me that gets fulfilled too. Mm. And if I can be honest about that, I can't be honest about my work. Mm. And I think that applies to so many work too. You yeah. have to be honest about your agenda, because if you're not, then you're tricking yourself, honey, and you mm. don't want to do that. I see. You want to be honest with yourself. Yeah, I could only imagine the kind of. Problems are bringing to you, and of course, they are dumping a mm. lot of like sadness or mm. suffering onto you. How do you survive all of those without involving yourself too much? Because <laughs> listening to a friend complaining for one day, it, it could get me crazy, <laughs> literally. Ah. But you have to listen to like a mm. lot of people complaining about a lot, mm. not the usual kind of problem mm. where they can just talk to a friend and then just go away, mm. right? But it. it I assume it's like a hard mm. questions or like severe kind mm. of struggling. Mm. How do you save yourself from suffering along with them? Yeah, like just now, y- you said like I'm. Oh, I look like I, I can be very good with talking with people, right? So even though I I come across as very extroverted. And that I like to talk to people. The way I reserve my energy and I keep myself safe and sane is that I have a very small group of people that I know I can go to. I know that they could help shut me out if I need a safe space for me to like recover. Mm-hmm. So that maybe refers to my mom. I see my own psychotherapist weekly for mm-hmm. at least five years now. Mm-hmm. Like I do that for my own, my own like benefits too. And I would comfortably say that in my life I have like six friends, and they're the only six friends I need in life. Mm. So even though I talk to a lot of people, the people I keep close is very close to me. Mm. So when I know who my safe space is, right, mm. I know how to disconnect from these problems and go to them. Mm. Yeah. So safe space or safe zone, as people say, uh, I think it's very important, and a lot of problems. That we have heard from a lot of people is that they don't have this kind of people or mm, 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 mm. this space, this kind of space that they have no safe zone. I- even it's at home mm. where people might assume that oh, family is Bullseye. your best bet to Bullseye. be a safe zone, but not always the case. Yeah. So, what what do you what kind of advice can you give them? Like yeah. if they feel like they have. No safe zone whatsoever. Yeah. You took my punchline. What? Like, you're so great. You took my punchline. I love it. I want to echo what you said. Is that the first misconception is that your family has to be your safe zone? That is one of the biggest misconception. Family and your partners or lovers doesn't mean they have to be your safe space all the time. Mm. Often they can be very toxic, abusive, and manipulative too. Mm. To me. And people ask me, "What what is a safe space for you, Cohen?" And a safe space for me is a space where you feel safe to feel. And when people spe- hear this, like feel safe to feel, right? They're mm. like, "Ah, oh, so good energy, healing space, a space where you go in and you heal from everything." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no! 
honey, no. Safe space means a space where you can feel down. You feel safe to feel down. Mm. You feel safe to be upset. You feel safe to express something without the fear of them judging you. Mm. So you both can coexist in this space without feeling like you have to change the other person so they uh, feel better. Yeah. Okay. But you can feel safe to feel mm-hmm. any kind of feeling, mm-hmm. and that's what a safe space means for me. Yeah, and I think that's that's a big problem for a lot of people. Mm. Like, okay, if I am a safe space to to you, for example, and you come to me and you cry and you feel down, and they kind of feel like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> I should help you. I have to help you. Mm. Otherwise, what is a friend for, right? So I try to. Help you okay. or fix you or yeah, just bring you back to the your normal self. Yeah, am I wrong to think that or what do I do? I don't think you're wrong, but I think you put a lot of pressure on yourself. Then it becomes a lot of pressure. So often when I do this j u t p a k c h a i project, right? Mm. People come to me and then they're like, "I can't cry. I can't cry." And I like tell me more. Why can't you cry? And often the answer is that. They don't. They don't want to cry because they don't want to bring all this negative stuff to the other person, right? Uh-huh. And that's the total opposite of why our body cry. You know, we cry because we want to get something out. But then mentally, you're like, you don't want to give something bad to someone, right? Mm-hmm. A safe space would be a place where, like, you feel safe to cry to the other person. Mm-hmm. The opposite phenomena that happens too is that when Well, when the culture say that you can't cry to someone mm. because you're giving something, some one bad thing, right? Like negativity. Yeah. Yeah. The other person doesn't know how to handle that too. Then they be, they say stuff like, "Hup hup hup hup, ไม่ต้องร้องนะไม่ต้องร้องนะ Yeah. Because they don't know what to do with it too. The best thing you can do for someone when they cry is to coexist with them. Just be with them there. Tell them that. How can I support you? Not keep it open. How can I support you? Mm. Or you can both sit in silent together, and it's fine. Mm. Because do not forget this. As soon as the listener, as soon as you're focused on, what do I say to make them stop crying? Mm. What do I say so that they feel healed? What do I say so they feel good? Mm. You're not there for them anymore. You're there for yourself. Oh, okay. You're doing it so you feel good that you have helped someone. That's true. And then the intention of helping them is gone. It's the intention of what do I say and what do I do so that I fit the best and the most right way with this person. And then your listening skill is gone. The active listen, the act of acting, active listening is gone already. Because mm. you're not doing it for them anymore. You're doing it for your needs. Mm. Just be there with them, and that's mm. enough. Enough, meaning that that is one of the most difficult job you can do for someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be there. With someone, mm-hmm. without trying to make them the way that makes you feel comfortable, mm-hmm. is one of the hardest things you can do. Because most of the time, I don't think people realize that either. Yeah. Like, oh, this is I'm me doing things for myself to feel good. So, th- so I know that I healed you. So then this can be <sighs> over. And then the the act of doing it empathetically mm. is gone. Then you're doing it to feed your own egoistic needs. Mm-hmm. How do I say something that is so revolutionary that it heals the other person? Mm-hmm. You don't need to heal them. Mm-hmm. You just need to be there with them mm-hmm. so that they don't have to go through this difficulty alone. Oh. And that's the key word yeah, that yeah. we can suffer not alone but with someone. Mm. Therefore, the suffering becomes less scary. But it's so hard to do. So hard, so hard. You have to like stop yourself from, mm. but knowing that. This is not for them, but it's for you. Yeah. But you're here for them right now, so yeah. just direct the attention to them. That's why. That's why boundary setting is very important here. Mm. That's why saying no mm. to a friend when they're like, "Can you hear me out? I'm, s- I'm in a bad place." Mm. That's why if you feel like you can't do it for them now, mm. it's okay to say no. It's okay Ooh. to be like, you know what? I love for you. I feel you, man. I care for you, but. I'm struggling today too. Oh. Can you call A B C D E first? Oh. And if I'm ready, I promise to be in contact with you ASAP. Yeah. That's very important. But but I don't want to generalize. But it happens so much here in Thailand too. Is that 
people do it because they เกรงใจ and when you do it because you're เกรงใจ empathy is gone already yeah. you're doing it because you want to feed these needs you have yeah. Yeah. and you don't want to seem heartless yeah it's like well why don't you help them even though you're struggling yourself inside but well they're crying so you you might at least hear them out or even though you're not ready right to be cup if you can't save yourself mm-hmm. you can save no one mm-hmm. and that's the most important things i see people who will give and give and give and give so they get the external validation that they're enough Mm. In order for them to be good enough of a person, mm. I have to give, 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 give because that's our culture narrative, right? Yeah. But then, if you give so much that you have no more water left in the well, mm. who will, who will refill that well for you? No one. Mm. Help yourself first, yeah. and then help others. And that, I would say, that is not selfish. Mm. Self care is not selfish, mm-hmm. because when you're ready to help, right, mm. then you can do it 100%. Yeah. Totally, yeah. but now people are doing it on autopilot. They're like, mm. "Damn, I had a bad day with my boss, and my partner is being an ass." And k o n i t o m a this week, ก็กินอาหารมาไปแล้วสามรอบ But then I have to pick up because I don't want to be a bad friend. Mm. And when you do that, maybe you're not even helping them. You're helping yourself, and maybe you're causing more damage too. Mm. So when you want to help someone, right? Ask yourself. Where is this coming from? Do you want to help them because you really empathize with how they feel, mm. or are you helping them because you want to feel good? Mm. And often, if you want to help people to feel good, I would say park that car for now, because you may cause more damage without knowing. Yeah, it's the uh, put an oxygen mask for yourself first kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we do need to realize this. When was the last time you said no to someone? Mm, yeah, it's a good no, question no, 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 to no. ask yourself. Are you asking me I'm now? asking you. Oh, uh, I'm saying no to people all the time. Good, <laughs> good. All the time, yeah, because I have learned it the hard way. Mm. Yeah, and I kind of realized that, okay, this is not good to just say no. yes to things. No, mm. you know, my mom is in her 60s. She's only learned how to say no to her parents this year. Wow. I'm yeah. like mom, like. This is not good. Whatever you're doing mm. is not working. Learn to say no to your parents, and it's fine. It's human. Mm-hmm. And now both of them are having the best relationship. Because uh. now she learns to say no, mm. and now the grandparents have their own boundaries too. Yeah. And it's good. Learn mm. to say no. It's okay to say no. Mm. Could be a lifetime struggle 100%. for someone. Hundred yeah. percent. Okay. So let's talk your uh, expertise. Let's go. Okay. You specialize uh, the gender. Okay. Talk. So LGBTQ, AI or IA plus. So a lot of letters. Oh, there's more now. Now that's LGBTQ AI two S N plus. Are you kidding me? I am uh, not kidding with you. Wow. I have to read the internet every <laughs> month about for this because this is you have my to keep word. Yeah. Now it's LGBTQ AI, LGBTQ AI N two S plus. Wow. N stands for non-binary. Mm. Two S stands for two spirit. Two spirit. Two spirit. Oh, two that's spirits. new to me. Two I've spirits. heard non-binary, but two spirit. Two spirit. W- w- what does that mean? Uh, it's a concept that we have. The scholars has accepted from the n- uh, northern indigenous American people. Mm. It's when you have like you feel like you have two spirits in you, like. Both the feminine and masculine, the men and female, <gasps> and in different culture contexts, it's different too. And I think I have to e m p a t h i z e here on the indigenous culture. Indian indi- indigenous culture is that the Western culture would like to understand the framework, so they found a way to incorporate it too. Mm. So it's it's growing, it's growing, and and that's mm-hmm. that's a plus sign. Yeah, yeah. So d- this is my expertise. Yeah. I get confused in it too, <laughs> and I'm honest about this. I'm gonna, I'm right. not gonna be scared that people mm. are gonna cancel me mm. for not knowing. You have to know a letter because uh, I'm like, no, I'm, uh-huh. I'm human too, and right, we're growing and we are growing and I am growing. Let's That's grow. True. So we're learning as we are growing, yeah. right? And this thing hasn't stopped growing no. because it's still there's still new things like almost like every day that we can yeah. uh, discover. Uh, in terms of people's um, gender mm, and mm. identity and sexual orientation and what have you, so most of the time, I, I guess, it's confusing 
for you too. But yeah. how can you help people uh, be less confused okay. of who they are? Who are we talking to here? Straight cis people, hetero people, or mm. the LGBTQ plus people? Mm. I have to answer for diff- two different groups. Okay. So uh, how about LGBTQ okay. community? Okay. Mm. Hey, community. Uh, I think having the framework and the label is mm. great. It helps you navigate who you are or where you want to go. Mm. I would also say that you know, take time. Mm. Ask yourself. Like, if you say you're a gay person, ask yourself what being gay means for you. Mm. Ask yourself what being queer means for me. I relate to gender queer the most because mm. for me, being queer is to stir things up, mm. is to challenge things, mm. is to be unsettling. And as soon as you can define what queer means, the essence of being queer is gone already. It's uh-huh. unidentifiable. That's why I like the word queer because I shift all the time, uh-huh. and that's why I feel like I relate with the queer. Uh-huh. Bouncing back to you, mm. having these letters help you identify yourself. That's great. Because when I was younger, I was lost. I was like, mm. what the fuck am I? Who yeah. am I? Mm. Who do I relate to? Where are my people? Yeah. I think these labels and these letters help you navigate your way through life. Mm. Good. Now that you found it, ask yourself what it means for you. Mm. And it will keep adding up. And it's good. And it's fine. Yeah. So to you, labeling is not necessarily a bad thing. Because we, we hear about, ah, don't label people mm. because that's bad. But in this case... It's good for a lot of people to know yeah. their position in don't, the world. Don't don't forget, you said what you said. You you said correctly. Uh, labeling makes people feel safe. Mm. They can structure who they are, mm. who they want to be, mm. and where their people are at. Mm. And labeling helps with that. Mm. But again, don't forget. If you're too strict on the alphabet itself, too, it uh. leaves you very little space to grow. Ah, I see. Because it becomes this narrative of like, well, gay men can't do this, and queer people can't do this, and transgender people have to be this. Ah. And then again, come on, guys. (laughs) We're doing, we're creating this community of inclusiveness. Right. And then we're putting like structure on things again. Like, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Use the label, use the alphabet to find yourself, and then grow from it. So you still believe uh, in everything being... Uh, fluid. It of course, could, of course. Changing back and forth, and it could go like separate ways. For me. Okay. For me, yes. All right. Okay. I will never force my opinion upon anyone. Mm. If someone is like, I'm gay, and I would act as how a gay man should act through mm. the Oxford Dictionary, <laughs> I'll be like, go for it, my love. Yeah. It's your life. You do it, darling. Oh, okay. I see gender very fluid. Mm. I find new ways of relating to people. Mm. I find more people, the more I grow up, Mm. the more I find different people attractive. I Mm. find different genders attractive. Mm -hmm. My sexual orientation changes. My sexual preference change also. Mm. And you know, it's it's a process. It's a process over progress. Progress means you have to go somewhere and evolve all the time, right? Process means you shift and you change and you fall and you mm-hmm. find something new mm-hmm. and you rediscover and you revisit and I like that. Mm-hmm. And for all, a lot of people who do not belong to this community, but um, to the best of their ability, they want to be an ally, right? Great question. But it's very confusing to them. Yeah. Let's say if they have a very close relative or a person very close to them uh, going through all these um, changes yeah. and they cannot keep up. Yeah. Basically, they cannot keep up because they just don't get the concept okay. or um, they haven't taken enough time yeah. to understand each other. So w- what kind of advice do, okay. do you have for these people? Okay. I will use an advice here as my mom, okay? Everyone, not everyone, a lot of the people on the internet things that my mom is very like future forward like damn she knew what she knew what queer means and three years ago she understood Cohen about his movement about uh, cloth has no gender and everyone's like wow your mom is very future forward right mm. I keep saying this my mom doesn't understand shit <laughs> she doesn't know uh-huh. anything but she is respectful She is supportive. She has got my back. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and that is all you need. You know, create awareness that you know enough details and information that you won't hurt mm-hmm. other people in other different community. Mm-hmm. You don't have to write an essay <laughs> about the LGBTQAI2S yeah. and plus community. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. At least know that you won't say something to hurt them. Mm-hmm. We grew up quite difficult already. You know, yeah. we don't want to be triggered every day. Mm. Know enough, and what you don't understand is fine. Just respect them. Uh. This is the case of a good ally. You know, like, but you also have the other group of the people of like, what else do they want more? And they keep creating these <laughs> letters, and it's too damn confusing. Like too much. Uh-huh. I'm like. Okay, just leave them alone. Like if they want to have more alphabet, let them. <laughs> we're yeah. not. We're not saying you have to remember it. <laughs> I'm just asking. Just respect them. Mm-hmm. Leave them alone. Yeah. Like if the form of respect mm. is to just leave them alone. Mm-hmm. Just leave them alone, and that's you do it. That. Just do that. You don't yeah. have to attack them because the problem now is that they get confused. They get uncomfortable. Yeah, frustrated. And frustrated. Yeah, and they feel like their world is crumbling. Uh-huh. And I'm like, no, you still have your world. Just mm. don't attack them. Just mm-hmm. keep your mouth shut. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah. yeah, and and most of the time, is is just they don't want to offend people unknowingly. For example, the pronouns like. Oh, do they, uh, he, uh, he, she, her, he, him, they, them, and a lot of people might get like upset for um, using the wrong pronouns to them, and and maybe that happens to them before, and they kind of get like frustrated, like, oh man, how do we please these people? Do you think it's it's understandable for them to get confused or upset? <laughs> of course, yeah. People can't even say my name properly, patronize and so on, and I don't get upset over it, you know. Yeah. My mm-hmm. pronouns are they them again, mm-hmm. very fluid. I get it wrong sometimes. I don't speak English every day. Mm. Sometimes I'm like he. Sometimes mm. my parents are he, and I'm like fine, chill, it's okay. Because I understand what pronouns means for me. I don't have the need to attack people for it. Uh-huh. And I use the word attack, meaning that sometimes when I slept enough and I'm feeling good, yeah, I might do some awareness, and I'll be like, oh, I don't mind, but mm. some other people might mind, and mm. these are the reason why. Mm. But don't attack them. Don't be like. Hey. You, you, hey, you fucking piece of shit. Like, mm. you don't have to do that. Mm. And on the other side, too, it's okay to, like, make mistakes. It's okay to not know. It's okay to say the wrong thing. Mm. But when you do, take responsibility. Mm. Apologize to the people you have hurt unintentionally. Ask yourself what went wrong. Self-educate and improve, and that's it. Mm. I think the world now, not generalizing, but I am in a way, is that People, because there's cancel culture now, right? Mm. People leave very little space for self-improvement and learning. It's like you can't do this, you can't say that. And I'm mm. like, but if we stop people like this, how would they learn? Mm. Like how would they how would they learn? You know, mm. the abuse has become the abuser somehow. Mm. People need to learn that it's okay to fail, it's okay to make mistake. But then, how do you take responsibility from that? How do you take accountability from that? Mm. And that's the key word here. I used to go on to a date, right? Mm. And this man had the audacity to ask me, like, which Cohen is the real Cohen? Uh. And I'm so glad he asked that because it gave me food for thought too. Mm. So yeah. I had I had a man ask me, like, so I see you here. And you like fuck with my brain, and you ask me all these questions, and we have this uh-huh. serious talk, and then I saw I see you on the internet, and I feel like you're stupid on the internet. Like, uh-huh. which one is the real Cohen? Like, the were masculine? you offended by the no. question? No, no. He's like, are you the feminine? Are you the masculine? Or are you the serious one? Are you the stupid one? And I'm like, you know what? First of all, sit your ass down and let me talk to you. <laughs> and I told him that all the Cohen you see is real. Mm. All the Cohen you see went through difficult time. They have experienced different pain, and they have found places and different way of being in the world in different time, mm. at the right place and right time differently mm. and different time. Mm. And he was like, "Oh, I hear you." So all the Cohens are real and true and authentic, mm. but that's always the right place and time for it. I see. And I'm learning to balance them all together too. Is this also another definition of being queer? 
that you are Ooh. like Ooh. different and you could be many many things. See, this is when you know the interviewer is really listening to you. Ah, correct, exactly. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's good. So yeah. I think. Well, we can all be queer. We can in, all be in that definition. Is correct. good for you. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. Queer can be an academic way of thinking to mm. challenge way of how research is. Mm. You can queer things up by like, politically. Mm. You can queer things up through definition, like so many ways too. Mm. But you are correct. Mm. Like I have different ways I feel safe. For example, like when I am in a seminar, right? I have to bring Cohen in, mm. serious in. Mm. When I have to talk to younger children about mental health, mm. maybe I use Pimoy because mm-hmm. they can relate to Pimoy more. Yeah. And when I play with my mom, I just go playing stupid, and I'm happy <laughs> with that. Yeah. And I, I don't judge any parts of me because mm. all parts of me make me me now. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I think I seriously think it's your superpower, <laughs> and I think more people could do that Aww. because a lot of people are already that way. But they kind of feel like, oh, I need to be like one thing in order to be like firm in your character. Mm, mm, Otherwise, mm. you would look like you are faking it, right? You, ah, I love you. I love you for always listening to me. I also despise you for taking my punchline. You have take. You have. This is the first time an interviewer has took my punchline four times now. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. <laughs> that was a compliment. Okay. Uh, in my head, I was like, sip the coffee and then say that. You say it's a superpower, right? Mm. That's the bright side, and that's always the dark side too. Uh. I get a lot of people telling me that I'm fake too, mm. because that, oh, you act all this serious and then you act stupid on the internet. Mm. You act masculine now and then you're feminine now. And then there's people who project this insecurity of themselves mm. onto me and say that I'm fake too. Mm. So it, it does come up. There, there yeah. will be people who understand you mm. and be like. Why do we have to choose one when we can enrich all this taste and flavor of life? Uh-huh. And there will be a group of people who are like, "No, you have to be one thing at all time and dress the same and speak the same." And yeah. they will hate you for being different. And it's fine. It's fine. It's fine for people to not understand and hate you. And it's fine. I really like you for being who you are this way. Thank Because you. Because I always know. think that why can't we be like different? Uh, person each yeah. day, knowing that it's still us, uh-huh. it's still you. You can be p i m o and you can be Kuan. Yeah. Uh, the n g a n seminar, and you're still you. Yeah. Yeah. In in different contexts, a good example would be I'm asexual, right? Means doesn't it means I don't I don't really enjoy sex, mm-hmm. meaning that I have no sex in my mind, mm. but I can be super nasty on bed too because uh-huh. I know what to do. See, okay. like you can be all things. Different yeah. times, there's always the right place and right times for mm-hmm. things. I think a lot of people. Do not have a good understanding of this yeah. word. So yeah. first of all, is asexual, right? Yeah. So um, that was how much we call it. Ah, no, ah, we can't name, but we can't. It's like a prefix. Yeah. Is it? Does it work the same way? Like asexual means asexual, so not very sexual. That is the first time I have heard someone put it like that. Yeah. And if it is, I am not surprised. Mm. But. I cannot confirm for you okay. this time what it is or not, uh-huh. but I can give you the definition of what it means. So please, uh, asexual means you know it. It is a spectrum, though. It is a spectrum of someone who doesn't really enjoy or have that need for sex that much. Mm. But please do not forget, like being gay and being queer, asexuality is a spectrum too. So it means that they can be from little attraction to sex. To no attraction to sex at all. Ah. I'm in the between of my asexuality is in between of demisexual, so I usually have sex if if I have to if they're like can we have sex, only with my partner mm. or someone I'm like really connected to. So demisexual, it's when you have sex or feel the sexual desire when you with to only someone. someone you love, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sex. Okay. Sex means sex. I think sex means. I don't think. Sex means different things to different people. Mm. What what does sex means to you? It's an enjoyable activity. So it's to me pleasure. Sex pleasure. is pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. And it's a good way of connecting with someone because it's it's not something you can just do with everybody, right? Mm. Yeah. So it's special. 
Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for you, sex is an act of pleasure and to connect and right. something special you can share with someone, mm. which is great. And that mm. is sex for you. Mm. An act of sex for me is to please, to please and control. Mm. So for me, I have sex to please my partner or someone who I'm with, and that's it. Mm. I find pleasure in it very little. So the sensation is good. Mm. It's like it's like eating an ice cream. It tastes good. It's cold. It's nice. Mm. Sex to me too. Like oh, it, it feels nice there, but then that's it. Mm. If I don't do it, I don't think of it. So mm. to me, sex is to please, oh. and I think it's very important for people to ask themselves to what is sex. Mm. Someone feels other. Pe- a lot of people feel like sex means to own someone. Mm. Sex is to lose control. Mm. Sex is to gain control. Sex mm. is feel. It depends on what sex means for you. Yeah. And for me, like I said, because I'm on the spectrum, right? If my lover or my partner doesn't like nudge and be like, <laughs> it's six o'clock, <laughs> I have no clue on what usually is happening. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I think a lot of people don't have any concept of all these just because it's not portrayed enough in the media. Yeah, also, yeah. yeah. Because it's. It might not be so much fun to to take a look at, you know. Mm. It's like okay, horny teenagers mm. are a lot more fun, so we can see how the stories can develop and yeah. lead to like conflicts and fun stuff, right? Yeah. But people who don't feel a lot of sex drive, mm. how could that be an interesting ooh, movie, ooh, right? Ooh, don't don't confuse asexuality with no sex drive, though. Okay, I masturbate all the time. I see. I schedule my masturbation time. It's I'm like. Tuesday after seeing this patient masturbate at 8 p.m. It's on your Google calendar. Yeah, like okay. my, my body, my, I, my sex drive is high. Okay. But I have no desire to practice it with someone. Ah. ah. So it's two different things. Two different things. Okay, you might have a lot of sexual drive, sex drive, but maybe just with yourself. Yeah. Ah. Like sex drive to get this hormone thing out of my body. Yeah. But I have no need to be like, oh, damn, my boyfriend is... Eight hours away, uh, I shall go into grinder and get a quick hookup right now. Like, no, I don't have that. I see. I'm, a, I'm more of a, can we have sex tonight, Cohen? And I'm like, tell me your nastiest dream and let's do it. Because it's about pleasing them. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So if, um, I think a lot of people um, do not realize that there a whole spectrum yeah. of like sexual orientation yeah. or um, sexual needs. Yeah. So they might easily find themselves to be some sort of like I'm weird. Oh yeah. Why? Yeah. Why don't I feel the way I see yeah. from the series? I, I I felt that like most of my life, and I got people shaming me for that a lot too. Mm. I think uh, I had a boy f- in my life. I had now I have three exes, and all my relationships were. Four years, four years, and four years, right? Mm. Other than that, from my memory, I hardly slept with like anyone. Because I understood that, oh, sex is like having sex with my partner, right? So when I was single, or when I, when I didn't have my boyfriend, I got shame a lot from people mm. for like spending time with a man <coughs> or someone I like and not having sex with them. Mm. And people will be like, this is like it's too late, it's too late, it's too late, it's too late, it's too late. Which I don't know, why would I get credit from making too late? I'm like, wait, do we get extra points for that? Like, yeah. And how do I use that point? Is it a discount in Central? Like, yeah. the stand at the song, do you have a song? I think I'm so angry. And then, the more I be- became older, I-, I went to gay bars, right? Mm. I would get like, uh, free drinks, and I would make out make out with people in the bars and in the club. Mm. But then, when it comes to sex, I didn't do it, mm. and I didn't understand myself. Yeah. And I got a lot of shame for it, like from yeah. people. And I was like, Oh, you little tease. Yeah. Right. I, like you doing stuff with me, like we make out, and yeah. then you don't want to sleep with me. No. And and I take it very personally. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And I'm deflecting, mm. and I'm traumatized or what it is and the more I explore myself Mm. I found the asexual community and I'm like oh I see I enjoy the act of flirtingness Mm. I enjoy the act of connecting with people but sex doesn't come naturally for me Mm. 
and it's fine. And it took me 26 years to understand that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think this is where like labels are good for you because you can just go explore. If you feel like you're not like most people yeah. from your perception from the media yeah. because you don't experience like the real people in real life, mm. like mm. billions of people, but you can just see like movies. Yeah. If you feel like, oh, I'm not like mainstream, you can go explore. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good thing that we have uh, people like you who are talking about this on your platform. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of resources these yeah. days. You can just go find. Go find and, and understand that sometimes when people don't understand you, they get scared. And when people get scared, it's bringing up their insecurity mm. and they will project it into you. Mm. Just let them be. Yeah. It's fine. Go explore your job. P, big share my wa. I talk about asexuality, right? Mm. And I go on dates. Mm. And I'm not ashamed. Like, I, I don't hide. Yeah. I, I don't experience myself as mm. a celebrity. Mm. So I have nothing to hide. I, I kiss men on the road. Mm. I do things in the bar and clubs, right? Like, I, yeah. I live my life. And then, like, when I go out on a date, like 10 minutes later, mm. someone would tweet and tag me and be like, <laughs> And I'm like, come on guys, I didn't do all this activism mm. job for you guys to Mm-mm-mm. internally be homophobic, you know? Like, asexual people have good relationships. They can have sex. They can get married. It's just, it's different for different people too. Mm. And then they're like putting us in a box. Okay, you say you don't like sex. It means you also don't like to go on dates and you don't also like to connect with people. Mm. And I'm like, it's all different things. Yeah. Just like it goes back to our conversation. Yeah. Leave other people alone. Mm-hmm. Leave them alone. If you enjoy sex, go enjoy sex. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah people can help, but putting people in boxes sometimes. Yeah. So they can... Understand. They, they can, yeah. They can tell themselves that they understand things. Yeah. yeah. And not only it to help, it's to help them understand, right? Sometimes being different for them triggers their insecurity too. Because ah. maybe when they were young, mm. they were different and they got a difficult time for it, which bless them, you know, bless them that they got a difficult time for it. But it gives you no right to create more wounds. Mm. Yeah. Hurt mm. people, hurt people, mm. but healed people also heal people too, Pibik. Yeah. And that's very important. Yeah. The thing is, the wound, it's its not visible for people to oh, see. Sometimes no. you don't even see it yourself. No. And that is so hard to just cope with. And you know, things. often how people hide their wounds, mm. they smile. They pretend and act that things are all right. And people don't see it. Mm. That's why I hear a lot of people saying like, or like their parents saying that their kids don't have depression because yeah. they saw them playing and smiling and laughing. Right. And I'm like, because that's what depression looks like. Mm. People mask it, yeah. Mm-hmm. They try to hide. Hide it, yeah. Because they don't even know how to cope. Yeah. So just put put it away for now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So what do you have um, for your future plan? What else Ooh. would you like to do after you finish your PhD? Ooh. And right now you have a uh, Pak Jai. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Right now, I think one of the biggest projects I'm putting all my energy and my mind too is uh, the creative space. I've mm. opened up in Chiang Mai in Chut Pak Jai. Mm. So it's a building with three stories, three floors. And the first floor is a cafe. Second floor is a social library where people can come and use books for free. Mm. Take it home if you want because we trust that you will bring it back. Free art gallery, people to come see for free. And on the third floor, we're opening free counseling service and workshop workshop so like we can teach people things they want to learn and if people want to use the space to like hold some meetings or to have gathering that they want to be confidential it's also free Mm -hmm. so it's a space where people can come explore themselves Mm -hmm. and it's in Chiang Mai Chiang Mai if anyone has the time please come and visit I want to come by because yeah I go to Chiang Mai almost every year anyway next time do you promise to come and to text me I promise okay I promise I'll stop by I'll stop by. I'll take be sure comment. to be there. Yes. Yes, okay. yes. All right. Good coffee? Very good coffee. Okay. Very okay. good coffee. I'm definitely there. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what have you learned from, from doing this Jut Pak Jai? Anything surprises you at all? You mean from other people or from me myself? Both. Okay. From other people would be that often when people talk ask me about Jut Pak Jai, right? They're like, can you share us the most 
traumatic thing and difficult thing that people have shared to you. Mm. And I'm like, first of all, it's confidential. I can't share. But the saddest thing is that when people come to me to Jut Pak Chai, right, what I do for them is the minimal requirement of one thing that human p e r s human being, can do to another person, just to listen. When people see me doing Jut Pak Chai, people think I'm saying these incredible things and stuff. Mm. No, I'm just sitting there in silence and mm. listening to them as who they are. Mm. And people, everyone should actually have this next to them, you know. And it, it, it's sad to know that. Mm-hmm. We're in a time where people struggle to find someone to listen to them. That's number one. That's what I've learned from this project. Number two, with Jut Pak Chai, I learned that I, I am good at turning things I like into business, and then my love for it decreases because it becomes more about the business side. I have been doing free therapy for four years now. Since I have my license, I have never took money from doing therapy at all. I have never took sponsorship with therapy work, and I found out that for me to have something that is good for me and u n b u r n out is to keep this therapy free and business free for me, mm. and it it keeps me u n b u r n out. Mm. I wake up every day tired, exhausted, cranky, but I'm also like shit. I want to be alive another day, and then I go to sleep, and then I wake up, and then I'm like. And this keeps going because I found what is meaningful for me. Yeah, and I would like to keep that meaning for as long as I can. Mm. I I plan. I've never said this in any interview, but I've planned to retire when I'm 40 years old. And when I mean retire, I don't mean like I won't work anymore. But I will do only passion projects, so NGO work, uh, community change work, and work. But everything will be not focused on the finance part. Mm. So for now, j u t p a k j a i keeps me from not being burnt out, mm-hmm. and I find more of these projects in life where I'm like, oh, in a short time I have on this world, mm-hmm. I don't want to make a. Ch- I'm not saying I need to make a change. Mm-hmm. If I can make a change, great. But if I don't, fine. But I found something that is meaningful for me, and that is enough. It's good for you. Thank you, Pipi. Yeah, it's like. Like you said before, this is helping me too. Yeah. So you're not like sacrificing yourself, nope. killing myself over helping people. No, but mm. it works both ways. Yeah, and, and I, that's the best, I think. Yeah. I I always say this too, you know, like you have to be honest about your agenda. Mm. You need to know what you're doing because if you keep lying to other people, you're gonna lie to yourself. You're gonna lie to yourself too. Mm. At the same time, if you want to do community change work, you want to do things for society, mm. it needs to be sustainable too. Because if you don't make it sustainable, you will be burned out in like two years, three years. I've met a lot of NGO people who does great work and they are amazing and the best, and they give so much that in three years they're like, I hate myself, I hate my work, mm. I don't want to do this anymore, I want to quit. And I'm like, because you keep giving my love. Make it sustainable, and it will stay with you forever. Mm. Yeah. Well, the best definition of sustainability that yeah. I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. You need to make it real for you to actually live this mm. kind of life in the long run, not yeah. just these three years. I'm gonna give everything, and then I die. Yeah. <laughs> like how? how? How would that work? You know. Yeah. In order mm. for you to help other people, you have to be able to help yourself first, mm-hmm. because if you can't, you're a hypocrite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. I cannot wait for our next conversation because it's been, I think, an hour already. Damn. Yeah. That was a quick I hour. But I want to talk to you more. So I'll talk to you some next, more. My next trip to Chiang Mai. Please do. Yeah. Okay. Please come see and me. And for people who want to stop by Chiang Mai, right? Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai. Can search it. Like, what? Jut Pak Chai. Or what? JPJ Space. Wow. Thank you so much for coming. So before we say goodbye here, um, since our show is called Comedy, right? Oh. So the obvious question. Comedy ของเขื่อนคือคำว่าอะไร Can we have one in Thai and one in English, please? Yeah. <laughs> in English, comedy, I really like to say "damn." When I like something, I'm like "damn." Damn. Because "damn" it, it's h e y and it's also k e u n Oh man! Damn. Nice. So yeah, this is totally yours. Yeah, and I'm like "damn," 
and yeah. I have a good, I'm not good, and I have a good relationship with this word because I remember when I was young, when I was five, right? I was like, mom, 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 why did you name me Kuan? And then she was like, because when we were pregnant, we went to swim in the Kuan, and I'm like, yay! Yeah. And when I was 24, I'm like, you and dad fucked at the Kuan, right? And she was like, yes. And I was like, damn. And then it stuck, and I'm like, oh, okay. Wow. Wow. I was Best like, story ever. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Oh, I really like it. Yeah. Damn. 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 Like, I, I own my feeling. Like, yeah. damn. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. Ooh. Okay. And how about one Thai word? That's a Thai law. Me, me, a This is one thing I really like about Thai language. Before I tell you which word it is. Mm. I feel like... If you lock yourself in the in your house from mm. Thai language for one month, and you come out, you cannot speak to anyone. It's gone. <laughs> it's like k u n a l t p a n g a l a n a t a m a n i l a It's like new words come up every week. Like someone should study this <laughs> phenomena. Like how do Thai people come up with new words and spread it so fast? I'm like that is so interesting. How do we do that? I think my favorite word in Thai is t a m a i t a m a i t a m a i Oh, good, good. Be- because t a m a i is, it's the <laughs> when I was young, right? Like we had this conversation in the house, and my mom said that my first word was t a m a y a and the second one was alaya, <laughs> because I was like a very curious kid. I'm like t a m a y a t a m a y a and I think t a m a i I really like this word because it. It helps me find out more. t h a m a y o u do this? t h a m a y o u feel like this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y o u have to do this? t h a m a y And on the opposite side, um, there's there's a saying like "not in my dictionary" or "not in my vocabulary." So it's something that you don't believe in, something that you are opposed to, that you will not condone, that you don't think it should um, be something that you use in your life. Okay. Any words that are not in your dictionary. I won't say it because if I say those words, I'm going to be cancelled. But yes, anything that hurts other people's feelings in the past, mm. I think we have grown to know that there's so much pain in the world, mm. and if we are aware that these words can potentially hurt someone, just don't say it. There's many more words. Just go say other words. Yeah, hurtful so, uh, words. Hurtful words. Like yeah. don't say it. Like why me? Why be mean when you can be kind? Mm. I've never seen. I've never seen like productive people who. Cares for other people and who is doing well in life, takes time to say nasty things to people. Mm. I've seen productive and like kind people be constructive. It's like you did this well. You are shit at this. You can mm. make things better by this. Why don't we do this? People mm. can work with this. Yeah. But then if you just say mean things to people, you're not helping them. You're just being mean. You're just mm. projecting your insecurity and. People can work with that. Mm. You're not doing any good, and why do it? Yeah, it's taking the same amount amount of time anyway. So just same. Yeah, the same. All right. Yeah. So, thank you so much. It's going really well for this interview, and I hope we can talk more in the future because what you're saying is super relevant, and and people can relate to yes. um, the kind of things that you are telling us on the show today. So thank you so much, yes. Kuyat, for w- coming. Without before we end this. Yeah, can I say something? Of course, go ahead. Without kissing your ass. Earlier today, I said licking your ass, which took it the wrong way. Yeah, it came out so wrong. So wrong, <laughs> so wrong. Without kissing your ass. Yeah, I think you has you have been the best interviewer for me the last three years. Wow, I can proudly say that. I feel like for one hour, I feel seen. I feel like you have able to. Make what I told you reflect back and ask me even deeper, and I really appreciate that. I feel like we have spent our time together here very meaningfully and very seen and valid, and I appreciate that. It means a lot. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.